Part one. You are going to listen to a talk about library system. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Right, everyone. My name is Kathy Smith. I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the library system. Every good student should learn how to use the library. If you have to do a research project, the library is the place to go to for information. Libraries contain books and periodicals, magazines and newspapers on many different subjects. To find the information you need, you must know how to use the library. All libraries are organised in much the same way. Every library houses a collection of books. Many libraries also have periodicals, films, and records. All the books in a library can be classified under two main categories: fiction and non-fiction. Books of fiction contain stories that were made up by the author. Books of non-fiction contain factual material. When doing research, you use non-fiction books because you are looking for factual information. All the fictional books in a library are grouped in one section. They are arranged alphabetically by the last name of the author. Many libraries also label the spines of all books of fiction with the letters F I C or F. All libraries have a system for organizing and classifying non-fiction books. The most widely used system is the Dewey Decimal System. It was designed by an American librarian named Melvin Dewey. It is called the Decimal System because it divides all non-fiction books into ten major categories. These are further divided into subdivisions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Divisions. For example, all science books are numbered from 500 through 599. Each different field of science has a number within the 500 category. For example, astronomy is 520, and chemistry is 540. The Dewey Decimal System provides a category for every type of non-fiction book. The best way to locate a book in the library is to use the card catalogue. The card catalogue is an index of all the books in the library. Information about a book is listed on cards. All the cards are filed alphabetically and stored in drawers in large cabinets. The card catalogue can help you locate a particular book, a book on a certain subject, or a book by a particular author. In the card catalog, each book has three cards: an author card, a title card, and a subject card. The author card is alphabetized under the author's name. The title card is filed alphabetically according to the title of the book. The subject card is filed alphabetically under the name of the subject of the book. In many university libraries, they use their own bibliotis cataloging system or the microfiche system. Both of them list publications under author and title, and both are very easy to use. Now let us see the reference books. We all know that reference books make up important part of a library's non-fiction books collection. They contain facts and information about any subject you can think of. Reference books are not meant to be read from cover to cover. You should use them when you want important facts and information about a particular subject. Let's see some major types of reference books. First, dictionaries. Dictionaries are books that list and give the meanings of the words in a language. They also give the pronunciation of words in a dictionary, which are listed alphabetically. Second is encyclopedias. 
Encyclopedias are reference books that provide factual information about people, events, places, and subjects of lasting interest. Each article is written by a specialist on the topic being discussed. An encyclopedia usually consists of a number of books arranged in a set. The volumes are arranged in alphabetical order according to the topic of each article. Letters are stamped on the spine of each volume to indicate the alphabetical rang of the topics in each volume. For instance, if you wanted to find information about the moon, you would look in volume eight of the encyclopedia pictured here. Next is atlases. An atlas is a book of maps. It may contain many different kinds of maps. The maps in an atlas are often arranged alphabetically by country or continent. Almanacs are also a type of reference books. An almanac is a book that contains recent statistics and summaries of information on a wide variety of topics. It is published annually. Information is listed alphabetically by subject. Indexes are alphabetical lists of names, titles, and subjects that tell where information about each can be found in other publications. For example, the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature can help you find magazine articles that have been published about a particular subject. It will give you the names of publications that have carried articles about the subject, the dates and volume numbers of the particular issue in which the articles appeared. You should be aware that reference books may not be taken out of the library under any circumstances; they are used only in the library. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions eleven to twenty. You now have some time to read questions eleven to twenty first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalog system, and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university, so make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area. The place for returned books and other items is at the end of the circulation desk near closed reserve. Closed reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on closed reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level two only. 
On level two are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the Audio Visual Resource Center. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the Audio Visual Resource Center is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use, and we've recently added a color copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone and there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues or you need to organize a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now, and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Caesar and a welfare officer. As you listen, answer questions 11 to 20. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good afternoon. My name's Cesar Bautisto. Hello, I'm Wendy, one of the welfare officers. Can I help you? Yes. I have to move out of my accommodation in two weeks, and I can't find anywhere else to live. OK. I'll need to know some details about your current situation. I'm an overseas student from the Philippines. The college gave me a temporary room for one month. I can't find anywhere else, and I have no money. Have you told the college about your position, or asked them to let you stay longer in your accommodation? No, not yet. I, I didn't think that would be possible. Well, we can contact the accommodation service on your behalf to see if they'll let you stay a little longer, until you can find an alternative. Thank you. But I'm not sure that I can find another place, as they all ask for money before moving in, and I don't have any. Yes, it is usual in this country for landlords to ask for up to a month's rent in advance. Don't you have any money at all? Hardly any. I'm waiting for my grant cheque to be sent from the Philippines at the moment. It should have been here for me to collect when I arrived in Britain, but it seems to have been lost. You can apply for emergency loan from the union if you want. The loan can be for up to £200, and we ask for a post-dated cheque for the same amount to be given to us so that we can recover the money once you receive your grant cheque. That would be very good.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'll apply, but I'm still worried about how to find new accommodation. As I said earlier, we can ask the college to extend the time you're allowed to stay in your present accommodation. They may refuse, of course. Then what will happen? If the worst comes to the worst, the union may be able to provide some very short-term emergency accommodation. If you want me to, I'll contact one or two of the addresses on the notice board and arrange for you to visit them. But what if they ask me for the rent in advance? I only have £90 left and I need that for food and books. It'll be all right. By the time they actually need the money, we'll have your emergency loan ready. Just fill in this application form and write me a cheque for £200, please. Payable to the Student Union. Right, I'll do that. Thank you very much for your help. I'm feeling more optimistic now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a postgraduate psychology student talking to other students about a job satisfaction study he has investigated. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. For my presentation today, I'm going to report on an assignment that I did recently. My brief was to analyze the methods used in a small study about job satisfaction and then to make recommendations for future studies of a similar kind. The study that I looked at had investigated the relationship between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction amongst workers. For this purpose, employees at a call center had been asked to complete a questionnaire about their work. I'll summarize the findings of that study briefly now. First of all, female full-time workers reported slightly higher levels of job satisfaction than male full-time workers. Secondly, female part-time workers reported slightly higher levels of satisfaction than female full-time ones did. On the other hand, male part-time workers experienced slightly less job satisfaction than male full-time workers. But although these results seemed interesting and capable of being explained, Perhaps the most important thing to mention here is that in statistical terms, they were inconclusive. Personally, I was surprised that the findings hadn't been more definite, 
because I would have expected to find that men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would experience different levels of satisfaction. So I then looked more carefully at the methodology employed by the researchers to see where there may have been problems. This is what I found. First of all, the size of the sample was probably too small. The overall total of workers who took part in the survey was 223, which sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into subgroups. Also, the numbers in the different subgroups were unequal. For example, there were 154 workers in the full-time group, but only 69 in the part-time group. And amongst this part-time group, only 10 were male, compared to 59 who were female. Secondly, although quite a large number of people had been asked to take part in the survey, the response was disappointingly low. A lot of them just ignored the invitation. And workers who did respond may have differed in important respects from those who didn't. Thirdly, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call center for distribution, the researchers had had very limited control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For instance, their responses to questions may have been influenced by the views of their colleagues. All these problems may have biased the results. In the last part of my assignment, I made recommendations for a similar study, attempting to remove the problems that I've just mentioned. Firstly, a much larger sample should be targeted, and care should be taken to ensure that equal numbers of both genders and both full- and part-time workers are surveyed. Secondly, the researchers should ensure that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves. And should they require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions so that the possibility of influence from other colleagues is eliminated? Finally, as workers may be unwilling to provide details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's important that the researchers reassure them that their responses will remain confidential and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time if they want to. By taking measures like these, the reliability of the responses to the questionnaires is likely to be increased, and any comparisons that are made are likely to be more valid. So, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.